and welcome to Game Sack. This time we're talking about anime games and manga. Yeah, those two things. Um, I don't watch a lot of anime, anime, whatever you pronounce it. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't watch a lot of that stuff. I don't know about you, so um, peripherally I'd rather play a fun game than watch a movie of that sort. But, but a lot of good games are based on anime mm-hmm. and manga, and mm-hmm. well, hell, let's just get right on into it. Indeed. Let's take a look at Sword of the Berserk Guts' Rage on the Sega Dreamcast. This is a 3D hack and slash where you play the role of Gatsu who has a weird girlfriend and he's looking for a cure. This game is based on the Berserk manga which focuses on Guts or Gatsu or whatever he's called. Basically he's a warrior who hunts down demons. He's looking for revenge against some dude named Griffith who agreed to sacrifice his friends including Guts. He saved his girlfriend Casca from being burned at the stake. The story in the game takes place after these events. And there is a lot of story in the game. Lots and lots of it. More than an hour according to the box, but that's cool. There's some pretty good voice acting in here for many of the characters. Michael Bell voices Guts and Cam Clark who's known as Leonardo and Liquid Snake voices the elf Puck. The town's right over there. Well, why did you take her? Forget it, Puck. I don't have time to waste on something like that. Anyway, the plot revolves around a disease that lots of people are getting which turns them into mandragorans which makes them look freakish and go crazy. A talking lion named Balzac wants to obtain the heart from some tree for a cure. But of course you can tell just by looking at him and listening to him that he is evil. A few years ago, a strange disease began to spread in the village under my rule. But you accept the job anyway. You learn more about the Mandragorans as the story progresses and lots and lots of other fun stuff. It's fairly well written and the storytelling never becomes boring. As an action game however, Sword of the Berserk is a mixed bag. You have a big ass sword not dissimilar to Clouds from Final Fantasy VII. It's really fun swinging this around and hacking people and things up. But the sword is so damn big that quite often you can't swing it very effectively since it hits a wall or something. This can be frustrating when you're surrounded by a lot of enemies. You have a few different moves that you can do besides your sword attack. You can jump, slide, as well as block. If your sword is sheathed, then you can attack with your fist or shoot some crossbow arrows at distant targets. But these attacks are generally pretty weak. Once the red meter under your life bar fills up, you get super pissed off and you go into rage mode. Guts is rage. Well, actually it's called berserk mode. The screen turns red, the controls are suddenly a bit more responsive, and your attacks are far more powerful. Also, your enemies do a lot less damage to you. It wears off after a little bit and then you become normal again. One problem that this game has is that it's often hard to aim yourself directly at an enemy to attack it. Also, you must wait for your animation to complete before you can do anything, even unsheathe your sword. It gets extremely frustrating watching Guts attack air when all you want to do is turn around and fight. You often slide when you want to block since the same button controls both actions. Still though, the game is pretty enjoyable to play. You have a limited number of continues that set you back a bit. When you run out of continues, you can save your game and then resume from a bit further back, so the game as a whole is quite manageable. Oh, and there's also quick time events that happen several times in the game, but usually it's only a single button press per event. This was actually released a couple of weeks before Shenmue. I wonder if they were tacked on during the last part of development when they found out that Shenmue was going to do something similar or if they just naturally did it first. Anyway, the graphics are sharp, but nothing tremendously amazing. I feel that the textures could probably use a bit more detail. As for the music, usually you don't even really notice it, but there are actually quite a few good tracks in here. Still, the sound and music generally create a slight atmosphere of dread, I guess you could say. I recommend this one if you can find it for around 20 bucks or so. Here's Shaman King Master of Spirits for the Game Boy Advance. This game was developed by Konami and released in 2004. It's based on the manga of the same name and follows the lead character Yo Asakura who is trying to become the Shaman King. As for this game, an evil character named Magister has come to take the Tome of Shaman. He's going to use it to revive a long dead champion of the Shaman King tournament named Mephias and use him for evil. As he fights to get the Tome, it breaks into pieces and pages are blown away in all directions. You must secure the pages before Magister can get them to do his evil resurrection. The game plays as an action platformer and you start out with a wood sword to fight with. 
As you progress through the levels, you'll find that some places are blocked and you can't get by. Luckily, you'll obtain spirits that will help you. You get these spirits by defeating certain enemies, or sometimes they're just sitting there for you to collect. Once you get the right spirit, it can help you open up new pathways. The enemies, for the most part, are easy and can be beaten with just a few hits. Once you clear a level, you go to an overworld map where you can choose one of the neighboring levels to enter. This is where you save your progress, and don't forget to do it because if you die, you start from your last save. And here is where I have my first problem with this game. I like the levels in Overworld Map, but to get around the map, you must play through each level. You can't just skip and choose your level, which is the way it should be, so you'll be playing through the same level over and over and over again. And I think I can see why the developers did this, because each level does have hidden areas, and this will ensure that you see them. So when you gain new abilities, you'll eventually be able to gain access, but it's still a chore and it does slow down your progression. So there's tons of these spirits to collect, and to help you use them, Konami made an overly difficult system for this. When you gain the ability, each hand can wield a spirit with the L or R buttons. Each hand also has four decks that you can assign these spirits to, and you'll be spending a lot of time trying to figure this out. Once you do get it figured out, it becomes easier, but I think you do spend a bit too much time messing around in the spirit unity screen. You also spend a lot of time traversing back and forth gaining new abilities and finding hidden secrets. Boss fights are few and far between. Even though I'm being forced to fight one of my friends here, I guess this would be a boss fight. Graphically, the game is fine. If you're playing on the Game Boy Advance itself, everything looks great. When you start playing on something else, like the Game Boy Player for the GameCube here, things don't look as nice. Character sprites look blocky and backgrounds seem to lose detail. Anyway, I've never heard of this game or even this manga before. About eight years ago, I was bragging about how awesome Castlevania is, and somebody told me that if I like Castlevania, then I need to try out Shaman King. Like a fool, I went and bought it right away. I mean, it's from Konami, and the pics I saw look pretty good, so why not? I can see where the Castlevania influence comes into play here. Spirits in this game can feel like your imps in Symphony of the Night. There's one level in here that resembles Castlevania with undying skeletons and such. Sadly, the music, while good, is no match for Castlevania. Still, this is definitely a game worth checking out. It plays solid and has a lot of cool features and puzzles to solve, so try it. Here's UN Squadron for the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. In this one, you're a pilot for the UN, who of course stands for Justice and Peace. Actually, it's based on Area 88, which is an anime and manga series in Japan, which is about a dude named Chen who was tricked into fighting for the Area 88 mercenary group. Also in Japan, this game is called Area 88, but the license was not used in the North American release, which of course became UN Squadron. In this version, the story has been changed with you trying to defeat a particularly well-funded terrorist group. You know, I used to dislike this game a lot back when the Super NES first came out, but I figured I'd give it another chance. I think before I was trying to enjoy it as a normal shooter, but it's definitely not a normal shooter. In this one, you actually earn money and level up your planes. I really like this aspect. You select between three different characters with slightly different planes and attributes. You have many different planes which you can buy when you have enough money, and they each can be equipped with different types of weapons which you also need to buy. I kind of like the shop as it reminds me of another Capcom game called Forgotten Worlds. Actually, maybe it reminds me a bit more of Lords of Thunder on the Turbo Duo. That was an awesome game. Anyway, you equip your plane and shoot down the enemy, forever ending their lives and bringing grief to their families just for some extra cash. It's well worth it in my opinion. I mean, you can't pay for new planes with the joy of happy families. Many stages play like a typical shooter, simply scrolling to the right and ending with a boss fight. Beat that and the stage is done but others will make you swoop back and forth until every last thing is destroyed. These are usually the tougher stages. There's also missions where you need to destroy ground convoys before the timer runs out. Your plane can equip multiple weapons at the same time and it's easy to switch between them. You also have a life bar and if you take too many hits while it says danger, you die right away. But it'll eventually recover some life, allowing you to take more hits in the future. What's cool is that you can select your missions on a map between levels so that you can save the tougher ones until you have enough firepower. The game itself, of course, is based on an arcade game of the same name. I imagine that most fans of the Super Nintendo won't like this one quite as much. That's because this one is a little different as each character only has their one plane. The weapons available to you between rounds are also quite limited. You also jump from one level to the next and you can't pick your mission. 
Otherwise it looks and plays in a very similar manner even though it's more straightforward for the arcade audience. Graphically the Super Nintendo version isn't as good as the arcade, but it's not bad, not at all. Little bits of Mode 7 are sprinkled in here and there to make up for the difference from the arcade. Sound wise, the game is kind of a mixed bag for me. I don't care for the instruments used, but the musical composition is actually quite good. I think it's something that you just gotta let grow on you and that comes with playing it for more than just 10 or 15 minutes like I did way back when I initially rented it. Overall the game is pretty good and it offers up quite a nice challenge. Though I don't care for cloud stages like this one where the enemies and bullets follow you as you move up and down, I, it's just weird. Still I like it a lot better now than I used to before. Pick it up if you want to represent the UN and all of its righteousness. All right, so what are you thinking so far, Dave? I'm thinking they're good. I like the uh, games. Like I say, I like playing them better than reading them or watching them. And... But a lot of these games, they don't even live up to the original anime or manga. Probably not. And, of course, um, the stories are different and shortened and stuff to fit into a video game. But you'd rather interact than just sit there. Amen. Yeah. People are not going to like that. I don't know. That's, <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. Anyway, let's just get into more games. Astro Boy The Omega Factor is a Game Boy Advance game developed by Hitmaker and Treasure. It's based on the original anime of Astro Boy where Dr. Tenma's son was killed in a car crash. Grieving the loss of his son, the doctor creates Astro Boy to take his place and doesn't hold back. Astro Boy is loaded with six abilities. He has 100,000 horsepower strength, rocket powered feet, the Omega Factor, which lets him experience human emotions and some other stuff I'll talk about. So the humans are becoming afraid of the robots and are trying to destroy them. The robots naturally resist and are fighting back. In comes Astro Boy to save the day and this is how the game starts. And what a game it is! Astro has two main attacks, which are his fists of course, and he also has a finger laser that's cool and goes across the whole screen. It's not the most powerful weapon, but it can be helpful. When the fighting gets tight and enemies are coming at you from all sides, he has three super attacks that really take care of them all. These attacks will use a super gauge at the top of the screen. It's usually not a problem running out of attacks as every time you strike an enemy, the gauge will fill up a bit. It takes no time to get two or three of these saved up. The first one is the EX Dash. This is great if you have enemies all lined up in a row as it will do damage to most if not all of them. The second one is the Shot Weapon. This one is good if you have enemies above and below you. Astro Boy has guns in his ass and they hit everyone on screen. And the last one is the Arm Cannon. This one is also very effective if you have enemies lined up. These are all fun to use and you'll be using them a lot. In fact, you'll be using these as much if not more than your usual attack as that's the way the game is set up. As things progress, naturally, the enemies will get tougher. This is fine because all throughout the story you'll meet many different people. After meeting them, you get to power up one of your special abilities, keeping you just as strong or even stronger than your enemies. It's a good idea and it makes you decide where you want your power. I'm pretty even, so I like all my abilities to power up together. The action stages are all really fun and you'll fight your way through a variety of nice looking backgrounds. To keep things fresh, there's a few shooter stages here as well. Some of them look pretty amazing with really bright graphics and lots of layers of scrolling. As you'd expect from Treasure, you're going to encounter many bosses and some of them are crazy to fight. Like this guy here. He's supposed to be an artificial sun and he gets super huge towards the end of the fight taking up the whole screen. With all the constant action and huge sprites, things will slow down from time to time, but I think it's forgivable. I was really surprised at how awesome this game turned out and it almost made me feel like learning more about the Astro Boy anime. Almost. I highly recommend this game, so pick it up if it looks good to you. Let's take a quick look at some Hakuto no Ken games. This is the Master System entry. This of course is based on the anime and manga of the same name. It's known as Fist of the North Star in the West. It stars Kenshiro who can make his enemies bleed gallons with just the slightest touch. So it's no surprise that when he punches and kicks enemies in this game that they shatter into a bunch of pieces. 
Each stage, well most stages anyway, have several mid-bosses to fight and some of them can only be dealt with by using certain attacks, like a low punch. After that you fight the level boss and the sprites are bigger for this extra super special event. It kind of plays like a one-on-one -on -one fighting game here but without any of the special moves or any of that fancy stuff. You gotta be careful though because some bosses can kill you instantly. Sometimes the letter P floats across the top of the screen. If you get it, then you're invincible to the next 10 to 15 enemy hits. The music changes during this so you know when it's in effect. Overall, it's a decent game. This one was brought over to the west as Black Belt. They changed the game for the better in pretty much every regard. There's more things floating across the top of the screen to grab, which makes things a little easier. But at the same time, the bosses are much harder. The graphics are a lot brighter and more pleasing, and they also changed the music for the better. Much better. There was a sequel that was released early in the Mega Drive's life called Shin Saikai Ma... Well, let's just call it Hokuto no Ken. In this one, when you attack your enemies, they explode into a mess of blood, starting with their head. I'm not sure why the enemies keep running towards Kenshiro to attack him when they see what happens to their friends. It's gonna happen to you too, come on! Anyway, this game sucked. It was brought over to the Genesis as a launch title called Last Battle, where it also sucked. There's also Hokuto no Ken on the Famicom. This one controls similar to Black Belt with the different buttons for punch and kick and pressing up to jump. Some of the deaths can be kind of gruesome for an 8-bit game. If you die, you start back at the beginning of the level, not like you'd know because it all looks the same. I'm not sure if I should be going in any of these doors or not, I'm not really able to get in them. Anyway, this one was followed up with Hokuto no Ken 2, and this one actually came out for the NES as Fist of the North Star by Taxan. This game is much improved over the first one. The stages are now better designed and it usually doesn't take long before you encounter a mid-boss or a boss. You can collect power-ups along the way which grant temporary powers. You can also collect stars to power yourself up and eventually you'll be able to throw fireballs. To enter doorways you need to press both A and B as well as hold right all at the same time. Oh my god is this easier said than done. GET IN THE DOOR! And yes, I went back to the first game to try it there and it didn't work. While this game is better, it's still a bit below average, I'd say. But wait, there's also Hokuto no Ken 3 in Japan for the Famicom, so let's take a quick look at it. They decided to change this one to an RPG for some reason. You start out by wandering around town and gathering companions. You also seem to have the ability to teleport to a few different places right away. The battles aren't very impressive, they don't look very good and they're pretty slow. But at least the game's music is fairly good. Nobody ever bothered to bring this one to the west. The same goes for Hokuto no Ken 4 also on the Famicom. This one also happens to be an RPG. And in order to make this one longer they had the text draw on the screen really, really, really. Slow. The scrolling in this one is also much more jerky. The battles are similar in appearance and execution to part 3, so yeah. The music has been improved a lot, but it still feels like a low budget game, even for the time. There are tons more Hokuto no Ken slash Fist of the North Star games, so you tell us, which one should we cover next? This is Golgo 13, top secret episode on the NES. Not very secret, is it? It's based on the manga about Duke Togo, who is Golgo 13. The game starts off with a helicopter that's carrying a bacteriological weapon exploding. The vaccine and plans were stolen from the wreckage by a group called Drek. The CIA concludes that an expert sharpshooter was responsible for the explosion, so it must be Golgo 13. To clear his name, he must take out the leader of the Drek group. You start the game off walking down the streets of Berlin. KGB agents are trying to kill you as you look for somebody named Condor. The funny thing with these enemies is that they'll shoot you until you pass them and then they walk away like nothing happened. For the most part, they're all easy to take out or just jump over if you don't want to fight them. 
One problem I have is that Golgo 13 can't shoot his weapon while kneeling down, which is a bummer since your enemies all seem to fire when they're kneeling down. You can shoot while standing, but the bullets just fly over their heads. You can go into subway stations and some of them will have somebody with information for you. Every now and again you'll get shot at from the side. When this happens, the game goes into a first person mode. The number and type of enemies that you have to kill is at the bottom of the screen. Once you dispatch everyone, the game goes back into the side-scrolling action sequence. As you slowly piece the story together, you end up getting into a helicopter to take out a sniper. Here, the game plays as a shooter. It's pretty simple since every enemy you kill, be it on the ground or in the air, will give you life and ammunition for your weapon. The sniper scene is pretty cool as you search the screen for your enemy. Once you find him, you shoot him. You know you got him from the blood spray that Nintendo forgot to censor. Damn, that felt good. As you head back through Berlin, you meet up with Cherry Grace at her hotel. You give her the file on the vaccine and then she, well, well, you know, refills your life bar. And you thought Grand Theft Auto was the first to do this. The next day you're feeling really good, although you're a bit tired. You get some scuba gear and go swimming in a river. I've never known a river to have sharks and octopus in them, but I guess Berlin has them. After you make your way through here, you come up to the first 3D maze. This is where the confusion starts and you wander around the halls of this maze like a senile old man. Everything looks very similar and it's super easy to get lost. You can blow holes in walls with grenades and you can even get infrared binoculars which will help you see a wall of lasers. It doesn't matter because you're still going to be completely lost. Sadly, this is where I stopped playing the game for now. But what I did play I really enjoyed. I think the graphics are good for the NES. I really like all the different styles of play going on here as it keeps the game interesting. The story is also really well written and engrossing. Make no mistake, I am not done with this game and I will find my way through those damn mazes. One of the greats for the NES with some content that Nintendo let slip through the cracks. And there you have it, there's a bunch of anime and manga based games. <laughs> yeah, let us know what else is out there because, you know, I'm sure, God, there's probably at least 50% of the whole library of video games is based off of this stuff. <laughs> Seems like it sometimes, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, hugely. Yeah. And anyway, of course, we couldn't cover every single game based on anime and manga. I mean, Dave, why didn't you cover, I mean, how can we have an anime and manga game episode mm -hmm. if we didn't cover... Yeah, exactly. What the comment below says. I, I don't know. I don't know, but I, we'll work on it. We'll yeah. rectify it. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll cover this topic in the future. Mm -hmm. Let us know of games that we should cover. And in the meantime, thank you for watching GameSec. Magic Night Ray Earth? <laughs> I'll bet Joe has a full length body pillow of you. Hi, Dave! I'm going to a cosplay convention. You want to come? Hell? Um, no. I. Do you know who I'm dressed up as? Well, you you narrowed it down to about 15,000 characters, I guess. You're but... not going to dress up too? No, no, you know what? I don't think so. <laughs> I actually think I'm going to go home right now, so here. I'll, uh, I'll catch you later. Good luck, though. I hope you win. I'm gonna cuddle with my full-length body pillow of you.